Okay, guys, I'm going to start recording, so whenever you are ready. It's going to be pretty difficult because I lost the hearing in this ear, so if I don't hear you, I'm going to ask you to be talking about Yeah, please be very loud. I appreciate you listening. I mean, it's tough, you know. I'm 81 years old, I've had a kid before, but uh, I feel like you can't. I'm not really. I'm a young guy, you know, 20 years old. Oh, fire away, I guess. Any, you ready? Yeah, we're all set. Uh, sir, uh, what is your name? My name is Earl Poisinger. Uh, where did you serve? I served in the uh, European Theater, which consisted of uh, Ireland, Italy, uh, sorry, Ireland, Scotland, England, Africa, Italy, Sicily, Corsica, Anzio Beach, and uh, Mount Casino, Italy, and uh, I think I was home in uh, Normandy because uh, I spent two and a half years over there before Normandy and the invasion. No, I enlisted. I was in the Army uh, 18 months before World War II started. How old were you at the time? I was 18 years old. Where were you from? Where did you sign up? I was in Buffalo, New York. When did you become part of the Army? Well, almost immediately. As soon as you join the Army, you're part of the Army. It says U.S., and that means us, Uncle Sam. Uh, that's why I, I stayed for 36 years. I kind of enjoyed it. I didn't enjoy the war part, but the military took her out to different places. Very educational. What was your unit? My unit was a 209th NA aircraft artillery located in Buffalo, New York, in the National Guard organization. And it was federalized a year before uh, uh, Pearl Harbor Day. This uh, was supposed to be one year of service. And after the one year survey was supposed to have been discharged and they were supposed to draft new recruits for the service. And they were supposed to spend one year. Well, after Pearl Harbor Day, Atlanta headed up and I was five years in the regular Army. And uh, after the Army, I was discharged for about four years and I re-enlisted and got to stay in for 36 years. Well, then I was a rank with a private first class. And my primary job is I went into the street at the bugle. And to this day, I'm still South Taft for any fallen veteran and uh, any military organization that needs me. I go out to South Taft for that occasion. Are you in favor of the war? No, nobody's in favor of the war. Uh, war, as General Sherman said, the Civil War, war is hell. And uh, I like to say that when I talk to the students, younger people, they watch television. And uh, what they see on television about the war, they, they think it's glamorous. Well, it's not. It's, it's terrible. It's, uh, uh, one time you couldn't talk about it, but as the years go by, you kind of relax and you take it in a little bit. You spend the hours. Were you in a relationship? You mean uh, engaged with a girl or anything? Well, uh, at 18 years old, you people know, you know young people, and sure you go out with Jane Doe and tomorrow night you go out with Helen Smith. And you never, at that age, I never really got involved. And uh, like I say, I stayed in until I was 23, and then I re-enlisted again. And finally retired in 1984. But as far as I, uh, I'm sure you've had favorite girls, but, but your most favorite girls are your mother. She didn't like it. When I uh, was 16, I worked for Western Union. We had a uniform and delivery telegrams. And my uncle was a World War One. He had a gas mask and World War One here, which I had over here a month later. And uh, just for the heck of it, I also had a BB gun and rifle. And I put the gas mask on with my Western Union uniform and a steel helmet with a rifle on my shoulder. And I go, I just look at me, Mom, I'm a soldier. You get that off of there, we're going to be in the war soon enough. And that was about 1936, 37. She knew it. Short time after. Was that anything else Yes, my youngest brother was in the Navy. My other brother, unfortunately, uh, 
It was deaf in his ear, he couldn't hear, so he was rejected. But uh, all my cousins, uh, male cousins, are in the front branch of the front. Uh, right now, I have a grandson that's in the Army Air Force, stationed in Alaska. I have a son that's a retired major. I also have another son who uh, had five years in the Army, he's now in the National Guard, giving physicals to all these troops that are going on. Right How did you stay in touch with your family? Well, mostly by letters. Um, it would take maybe three, four months. Uh, you write a letter say you wouldn't probably get that until two or three months, depending on the shipping, when the ships were over, depending on the ship was a torpedo or something. Many times we got mail that was, uh, they salvaged the mail that was uh, on a ship that was torpedo or sunk. They salvaged the mail, they tried their best. And uh, it was written in ink, naturally, the water would make the ink run. And at least you got a letter from home, no one thinking of you. When you could read some of the, some of the writing, well, like I say, most of it was uh, uh, distorted because of the, the wet, uh, wetness of the envelope in the interior. And also we had what they call a VE v letter. Um, was a, he would write a letter and then he would microscope this or put it on a uh, microfilm and uh, ship it over back home and then they would enlarge it again and they would mail it to your, your uh, relatives. The reason for that was to save space. You can imagine about a million of letters like this have taken a lot of space, but you take a little film, I wouldn't take any space at all. So um, I, I had copies of those, I was looking, but uh, all these years, I don't know where I put them, but they're still interested in some of the things that some of these servicemen wrote home about. And, and uh, the biggest thing is we all miss mine, we all miss the apple pie, and we all miss home. What was the food like over in, uh, you know, sorry you asked. <laughs> uh, I wrote a, poem, a little song for the Stars and Stripes, that was the Army newspaper. And uh, you, you the youngsters wouldn't uh, understand it, it was called Sierra Sioux. And uh, I wrote it like uh, sea rice and stew, that's all you get here, and so forth and so on. Well, it's canned. At that time, we had three different foods. We had stew, meat and beans, and hash. Well, the best of the three was the meat and beans. And uh, you ate those meat and beans for a while, and you got sick of those. And then we had sea rashes, which consisted of dehydrated food. And then you had your bigger rations, which all came in canned. It was very, very seldom we ever got any fresh food. I can elaborate on that, how we did get some fresh food. Uh, we were overseas for two years, and our company commander uh, says if we can get some fresh meat to cook with butcher, we have fresh pork or fresh beef. So we're on this uh, um, makeshift uh, landing strip for emergency uh, crash plane landings and uh, there's a bunch of pigs running wild so we went out and we kidnapped a pig and took it back and we didn't know it belonged to this farmer and the farmer got the military police after us and we had to give the pig back before he could butcher it. So there again we uh, went back to the sea rations. Uh, it's just like opening up a can. Well in fact your, your food today is much better than uh, the canned food much better we had then. I also have a can of sea rations here someplace in, in my, my souvenirs. Um, but uh, uh, we used to barter with the, with the natives. Uh, they were Africans, Arabs, they were Italians, or French, whoever they were. We would give them, as I say, cigarette Joe, cigarette Joe. We'd give them cigarettes and they would give us, give us uh, uh, fresh eggs, sometimes uh, fresh chicken, very, very seldom, because the Germans took everything uh, like uh, World, uh, the Civil War, they uh, burnt uh, Georgia, as you remember history, I guess. That's what the German troops said. Anything they couldn't take, they destroyed or, or, or killed. So uh, anything we got fresh, we were very fortunate. And we could not eat a lot of fresh uh, fruit because they fertilized with human waste. Over here, we fertilized with uh, animal like uh, cow manure, so forth and so on. And uh, that's why you find most of your foreigners, their teeth are falling out, or their complexion is ruddy and they break out the sores. So we could very, very seldom eat any fresh fruit or vegetables. Everything was shipped from the United States, and that's why most of it was dehydrated. It's 
put water in it, and then it comes up. But after after a few years, uh, either eat that or we, we go hungry. So is there ever too little food? Oh yeah, a lot of times. Uh, see, after the, the the American Army and the Allies got really into this thing, he who gets there first gets the most. And they kept pushing the German troops back. Uh, they were retreating, and our supply lines could not keep up with us fast enough. Now you realize that the ships, supply ships, had to come in from America over to a, the foreign port. Uh, we'll say Oran, Africa, or maybe Italy, <coughs> depending what part of the situation where you're at. And the supplies couldn't keep up with us that fast, so we used to have to have emergency rations like spam, dehydrated eggs. And this is one of the reasons why our captain sent us out to try to get this fresh pig. Uh, candy, that was impossible. The Red Cross used to come once in a while, and uh, make donuts for us, make ice cream. Then we had to buy our own donuts back from the Red Cross and buy our own ice cream. And we supplied all the rations for the Red Cross to make these things. But uh, again, we survived. And uh, you have a will to survive and uh, eat whatever is around. What kind of items did you bring with you when you went to war? Uh, you mean clothing or? Yeah, like what extra things? Well, when we left the United States, the uh, Salvation Army uh, gave us shaving equipment, uh, sanit uh, toothbrush, so forth and so on. And actually, you carry your. The most important thing was a pad and pencil so you could write home. Now, any mail we sent up in the upper corner, we would put free. That, and then your HAPO, Army Post Office number and they would send it this way. So that saved a lot of money, so we didn't have to have stamps. But if you, I, I used to play harmonica, just a little, I put that in my pocket. Uh, other soldiers had their guitars. They could take anything they could carry, but after a while, the harmonica got heavy. I'll let you uh, get one of my steel helmets here and try that out. You figure where that helmet all oh, the time. Uh, you, your personal items were your, uh, your own thought of um, what you think you would need. Of course, not everything was unavailable overseas. You could go to a local store and, and buy something uh, that was because there are great traders over there. Uh, souvenirs, Americans are the greatest souvenir hunters in the world. And uh, you want cigarettes and nylon stockings for the girls. We used to send home, send us some nylon stockings. And we used to get one five pound package from home a month. And I love potato chips and pepperoni. And I always was right for that. When I potato chips come over, I used to pick the ants out of the potato chips. Shake them off and eat the potato chips. You never threw something that was a delicacy. They didn't know what a potato chip was over there. And that you to say our parents back home had to sacrifice the pepperoni because the meat was rationed, the gas was rationed, the sugar was rationed. And uh, Sometimes we had so much stuff, like butter, it used to go rancid, sometimes. Uh, and again, we didn't have butter. And in, in the sea rashes, you had something to this day, I don't know if it was butter or cheese. You take like a hockey puck, that's how hard it was. So we used to give it to the natives, they used to throw it back at us. And I don't know if you know what these five flavors were. It's like a lifesaver with five different flavors in that package. That we used to get a lot. And there we used to play cards and gamble with, we didn't use money, we used five flavors. So then we used to give these to the native kids, and they used to get so tired of it, they throw them back at us and tell them, hey Joe, you take. And they wouldn't even eat them. But you know, certain things we got so much of, and other things we didn't get anything. Do you recall the first day that you were in service? <laughs> yes, very embarrassing. <laughs> I was put on guard duty, and I didn't know an officer from a sergeant or nothing. And uh, like I said, I'm right off the street. Well, I had a, a little job. I was a, a part-time, short-order cook in a restaurant, and I didn't like that. So that's why I joined the area. I was only making, what, five dollars a week. But um, I was on guard duty, and this lieutenant comes up, well, I knew he was a lieutenant after, and uh, he says, where's the guard here? I said, I don't know. I'm the guard. And I didn't know it. <laughs> See what I mean? I, I'm right, right fresh off the street. So, as I say, these things, they stuck in my mind, I, I remember them, 
And then, that's why he became a, a, a pretty good lieutenant. And we had a reunion, well, he's passed away now, but we had a reunion some time ago in Buffalo, and um, uh, his name was Warren Tubbs, first lieutenant. And uh, he got on the bus, we are going to this Rochester reunion, and I said, how you doing, lieutenant? He said, he says, Warren. He says, we're not in the Army anymore. I said, well, if you're still a lieutenant, as far as I'm concerned, you know, but that's respect. See what I mean? How was your boot camp training? Or like... Well, again, like I say, we're an anti aircraft. We had three battalions. The first battalion was uh, uh, 3.7 anti aircraft guns. That was a, a huge shell. Second battalion, which I was in, Battery E, were the automatic weapons, 50 caliber machine guns. And then we had 37 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, which were obsolete. And that's where we learned to retrain in Ireland on the 40 millimeter bolters. And the third battalion was a searchlight battalion. They had small iron machine guns, and they did the searching at night. Um, but the uh, uh, training I had, you had to, how can I say, be... Uh, sufficient or be familiar with every weapon in your organization from the small arms hand pistol up to the 40 millimeter tank and um, you would train from 8 o'clock in the morning till 1130 which would be recall and you go to uh, mass as we call it and one o'clock would be drill call and you go back out in the field and um, you would retrain then you would go on 20 30 mile hikes you have a uh, backpack on your on your back and you walk and the uh, Georgia sun and sand was pretty hot during the day and at night the ice buckets on our tents fire buckets would freeze that's how cold you should get at night um, but you learn to respect one another and uh, a lot of people used to complain how come we're always marching and drilling well the reason you march and drill is to have coordination so you know what I'm doing and I know what you're doing and we know what they're doing you say to the rear march, everybody turns at once. And this is the most important thing in combat that every soldier knows what he or she are doing together. Not that you do it on your own, or you do your I want to know. I'm the boss. Okay, this is what we got to do, people, and so forth and so on. But this is part of schooling, your education. Um, listen to your teachers. Uh, sometimes you might think they don't know what you're talking about, but they've been there, they've had the education, which you youngsters are getting, and, uh, but it's, it's not brainwashing you, and if you don't pay attention, uh, and you do get into a combat situation, it's your fault. But it was tough, I'm sorry, it was, like I say again, we just come from, from Buffalo, New York, which was cold, and <coughs> we left Buffalo on February 10th, and we got down to Georgia, three days later and we got overcoats on and we're marching through and there's a bunch of uh, southern soldiers there and they're calling them the Yankees and I think we would have stopped right there and then we would have had another Civil War because we had the overcoats on and steel helmets. We had the World War One helmet, not like the, the that's a German helmet there. But anyway, uh, they kept calling us uh, uh, German. They kept calling us uh, Yankees, and we kept calling them rebels, you know, but we got back to our, our units, and then we figured, hey, we're all United States soldiers, so we got to get it. But it's like you go to this school, and, and maybe your friend goes to East Aurora. Well, there's friendly competition, you see. But, like I say, one hand feeds the other, and camaraderie is the biggest thing in the service. To this day, we will still hit each other. Uh, like my buddy Harold Hansen, I call him ugly. Then he turns around. All right, that's between. I've known Harold for over 50 years. We're very good friends. But again, your basic training teaches you how to be a soldier. Numero uno, number two, to respect your your superiors and your buddy next to you because you're gonna, as we say, I'm gonna watch your rear. You're gonna watch my rear. He's gonna watch our rear. So you have to watch each other. But it's very educational and. And I would say, uh, should you youngsters ever decide to join the service, uh, war is not not fun. Uh, try it, National Guard, and uh, you could pick your branch. But if you get drafted, you're going to go into the infantry, and the infantry is, is bad. All due credit to the infantry. These are the guys that are fighting on the ground, on their bellies, like Mr. Hansen said out here. He walked through. Uh, 
through Europe. So, um, but again, it's very educational, and I learned a heck of a lot. And my wife and my mother and my sister always says, you know, I discipline my children, and uh, says, you spent too much time in the Army. Uh, well, that's it. <laughs> what was your living conditions like? In the service? Well, in the cantonment area, it was nice, it's the barracks. And uh, but overseas, uh, we had a pitch tent. Uh, we had a two-man tent a lot of times, or it's called a pup tent. Uh, each each man has a shelter half. You put these together, you button them together, it makes a pup tent. And I don't know where it comes from a pup tent, but it came from World War One. It is. That's a two-man tent. That's an emergency. So you would all team up with a buddy and pitch this tent to sleep. During the daytime, you had to break the tent down and uh, put it away, or else camouflage. And if you did camouflage, and every day you had to put new camouflage on, because the enemy were there before you were there, and they have photographs of all that area, and they know exactly what is there or what was there. They see something new, and start lobbing shells in there. So, uh, rain, uh, snow, Africa had snowed in the mountains, it was very, very cold in the African mountains. I only wish I could found some of those pictures, I'll still look for them. Um, we uh, ate and slept in the rain. You uh, sit there, there was no place to, to all, daytime, all your tents were broken down, like I say, so the enemy couldn't see them. You sit on uh, wherever you sat, on the edge of the, on the ground or tree trunk or something, and you'd eat. <coughs> And in Africa, they had a wind they called Sirocco. It would come out of no place, just like a hurricane. You couldn't see it. In three minutes, it was gone. And you could pelt it with, with uh, sand, sharp stones, whatever. And you're eating with a mess kit. The mess kit's over there. And the dirt gets in there. You close your eyes and try to cover the mess kit. And then you pick out, you pick out the big pieces. Then you stir it up and you eat. You get something, you spit it out. You didn't throw food away. Because there was, sometimes there was no seconds, most of the time there were no seconds. Well, like I say, this is the best kid, I'll, I'll explain this to you later on. <coughs> so, um, uh, we got raincoats issued to us after a while. Well, most of the soldiers had raincoats that went down to their, their shoes. And uh, I being short, I had a short raincoat, and uh, they also gave us arctics. Now most of the fellows had arctics above here, so the raincoat would cover the arctics. Now I had a short pair of arctics where the rain would go off the raincoat right into my boots. So I was drier before I had the raincoat on than I was before that. And also, these ponchos, I have a poncho right here, it's rubbery and it gets very, very, you sweat, you perspire inside. So you're, you're just as wet on the inside as you're on the outside. This is your your head. Again, like I say, I, I'll, I'll, we'll explain this later on. we get out of the conversation. Well, we went to bed with our clothes on. Soaking wet, you wake up in the morning, you'd be dry, your body heat. <coughs> you never, not never, I've all, sometimes I've, I slept in pajamas, depending on the situation. You figure in the combat, getting undressed, putting pajamas on. And it is, I don't know if you're, activated the scouts or not, but I was, I was a scout master also, I used to tell my scouts, uh, when you go to bed at night, take your clothes off, either sleep in your underwear or pajamas or whatever. Uh, why? It's because you sweat, when you get up in the morning, your clothes are damp, and you get outside, you're cold. I take my pajamas off, even in, in the army, put my, my uniform on, get out, I'd be sat in there, and the rest of the guy would be like, just can I tell you? They learn the hard way. So you, you guys ever go to uh, well, even with your family, uh, don't sleep with your, your clothes on. You even have to sleep in the, in the nude, you know, because your body sweats and your clothes absorb the moisture. So this way here, you get up in the morning, you feel a lot better. And uh, also, if it is wet, uh, usually we didn't have pillows. We would take our uniforms. Well, I sleep on two, three pillows at home. We put our clothes under our head for, for a pillow. And that way, sometimes the heat from your head would dry it out. And sometimes, again, you get up in the morning, your clothes are just as wet as you put them on. A lot of times, we slept outside. There was no tents. And um, only, one good thing that we were a mobile outfit, we had trucks, 
excuse me, which uh, uh, we did a lot of walking, but uh, most of our uh, moving uh, up, as we call it, would be in trucks towing our anti-aircraft guns. Uh, snow, that was something else. Many times you had to dig your foxhole out to get into the foxhole. The foxhole is maybe six feet by maybe as, long, as, as deep as you could, you could dig it to get in, and if it rained, I also have, I, I wish I could have found those pictures of fellows taking their steel helmets to bail in a foxhole out. So if they, they, they do get shell or attacked by airplanes or snipers, you could jump into that hole and hide. So it was tough. It was uh, many a times your hands would shrivel up, your toes, you got trench foot, uh, the skin would peel off your hands. Uh, well, I, I'm trying to tell you the bad things so you understand what a soldier went through. Now, Navy was a little different. They had clean, they had the fresh water, and they had good food, fresh food. In the Air Corps, the Air Force now, they had fresh food. But the ground troops, these are the guys that did most of the suffering. Although we needed the Navy, we needed the, the Air Corps. You see? Uh, what type of aircraft did you uh, defend against? Well, we were fighting mostly against the, the Germans. Uh, ME 109s, uh, Fulkers, Hawk uh, uh, Wolf, Messerschmitts. Um, uh, we didn't didn't do anything against those buzz bombs because they were shooting them in, uh, into uh, England. But this was most of the planes. We also used as anti-tank weapons. Uh, a 40 millimeter is oh maybe two foot long to, with the casing and the projectile. Projectile is maybe 10, 8 inches long and about that big around. I have a 40 millimeter mortar right here. Now you figure this would be the shell. It would be this long, but all together, the whole thing, this is the casing, this would be the shell. So this would be have high explosive in there, it would blow up. Either set a primer or intact, whatever, depending. Well, this would be a, a, a explosive, an air burst would go up and a burst in the air. There's a timer inside it. So, uh, but those are the most, we, uh, when we did, uh, we're using anti-aircraft or anti-tank, which mostly was in Italy, around Mount Casino. Uh, I think you've heard of the Abbey at Mount Casino. And there's a little village, Mount Fietro. And, um, our tanks were no competition really for the German tanks, the Tiger tanks, because they had heavy armament. We only had 75, they had 88 millimeter. And as the, uh, our American tanks would go around, the Germans were meeting them here and they, they blast them. So then we would try, even this would disable the German tank, uh, hit their tracks, this would bounce off the armor. They had four or five inches of armor. And this would go through our tank. We only got maybe two or three inches. <coughs> but that's where we used for, for uh, anti-tanks to try to hit the tracks. And of course, a lot of times, you don't know if you hit them or not. Uh, you see the explosion, and there's no, no time for sightseeing. Uh, you fire, and you hope that you can see the tracer going through and, and hit them. Uh, and also, uh, when they were going for Anzio, this is Sands on the Anzio Beach, which was one of the bloodiest battles. So I picked that up, I brought that as a souvenir. Um, the uh, regular infantry was being moved up to attack Anzio, and they we called mothballed our 40 millimeter anti-aircraft guns, and uh, we took our small arms, rifles, pistols, machine guns, and we relieved the infantry. And for 40 days, we were on the Arno River around the leading tower of Pisa, and there we stalemated the Germans because the experienced infantry were moving up for, to fight at Anzio. And then after we got fresh. If she shoots them up and really does, we got our guns again and we moved up to Anzio. Our, 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 our most important factor of anti aircraft was to protect staging areas, uh, supply dumps, ammunition dumps, troop concentration, hospitals, uh, bridges, uh, seaports, uh, any place that the Germans would think was uh, accessible to them to bomb. And after a while, that, uh, after the, the, they say allied, but believe me, uh, people that the Americans uh, 
did most of the, the fighting over there. Uh, the English, they suffered there. The French, uh, the French weren't too good. And the Italians were on the German side until uh, they, we, uh, the Americans, the Allies, defeated the Germans in Italy, then the Italians surrendered, and they came, then they were fighting on our side. But it was like, like checkers, so you jump near, I'll jump you. Did they give you plenty of supplies and weapons to use against Yeah. Uh, I think you remember I mentioned earlier that he who gets there first gets the most. Well, this is what America did. We had nothing in World War, before World War II started. I mentioned a 37 millimeter gun, which was a little bit smaller than this. It, it wouldn't fire as high as a 40 millimeter gun. So most of our weapons, weapons were antiquated. We had bolt operated weapons, and they come up with the Garand rifle. You slide it in, boom, boom, it was automatic. Every time you fired the uh, Springfield, you had to reload the thing, fire it, reload it. And you could also hear the click of a German was over at any was there, they could hear a click and they fire in that direction. Where this grand boom 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 you could fire eight rounds and then ding it would automatically reject and load it up. But um, uh, that's what defeated the enemy when we got there with the most first. Uh, they had superior equipment, their troops were in battle for many, many years before we were engaged, and the English they were there and they suffered alone for many, many years before the Americans got in. And they were teaching us the wars that they learned. In Africa, the American troops had a, a very big defeat, but they won the battle of Al, uh, Al Kabir, Mason Block, in Africa. That's where we got our feet wet. Uh, the uh, Allies taught us a heck of a lot there. But again, I say, uh, if you deadline one vehicle, you had another one there tomorrow. Take deadline means you it's out of action. Send it back to be repaired. You had one or two more to take its place. I was on a convoy in Africa. Uh, I can't. Th I think it was Algiers. We had to drive all the way back to Oran. We picked up 100 new jeeps uh, to bring up to replace the jeeps that were destroyed in action or malfunctioning some way. But the sand and dirt, like I told you, that uh, Sirocco wind, uh, just like now in Afghanistan, they got all these sands. That's, that's not going to hurt or help our equipment on that. And this is why I believe some of the helicopters are crashing the sands getting in there. But again, we drove up and brought these 100 Jeeps up and they distributed them to different organizations who needed them. But again, he'll get there first with the most wins. And that's what we did. We did. And also, one more thing. The German officers, they were only told what to do. They would go and say, you do this, you do that. Where the Americans, they would call all the, the officers, and the key non-commissioned officers, I'm a non-commissioned, non non-com, uh, commissioned officers, a lieutenant, captain, and major, so forth and so on. <coughs> and they, <coughs> they would sit down and would brief all the ranking people what's going to happen, what's, where we're going to go, what we're going to do. Now, they would go down and tell the privates and the PFCs and the, and the corporals. So everybody, as I said before, everybody knew what everybody was going to do. If a German officer got killed, the soldiers didn't know what to do. Comrade, they surrendered. I'm a leader, I got killed, you're a little private, you know what's going on. You could take charge if you wanted to. They would say, well, I'll see. Who's, who's got the more senses? You or you or you? Well, he, okay, we'll make him leader. This is up with you guys. No, you might get a promotion right on the battlefield. We've had people get from a sergeant right up to a first lieutenant in Korea, a friend of mine. He was a sergeant. All his officers got killed. He got wounded in the leg. He was shot. But he was, he, they, they, they reached their objective. And he got commissioned right on the spot of the first lieutenant. Usually they commissioned the second lieutenant, which is one rank more. So he retired as a captain. So, but again, I say uh, our equipment. Uh, once we got a foothold, our equipment moved up. Now you see what's happening in Afghanistan. They're moving so fast, their equipment can't keep up with them. But once they gel, look out! All hell's going to break loose. Do you feel a lot of stress or pressure when Oh yes, <laughs> every every day. Um, if you weren't a religious person before, I, I, if you were an atheist before, you were a God-fearing man. When you, uh, the first day your shell explodes, you, you start praying. And many a day, 
just been praying. God, thank you for saving me this day, you know, and take care of our buddies and so forth and so on. And uh, uh, in the height of the battle, Easter morning, it was raining like cats and dogs, and we're all out there in the, the uh, uh, chaplains saying the Easter morning services, and we're all out there, and we're bowing our heads, and you can believe what's going on in our heads. But you become very religious, and uh, you pray to God Almighty. Then again, you say, well, my buddy who got killed yesterday, he prayed to God. What happened? You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of thought. That, that's stress. Am I going to get hit tomorrow? Am I going to pull through? I was very fortunate. I never got wounded. Uh, again, my buddies are unfortunate. They got wounded. They got killed. A friend of mine got shot right across the legs. He was taller than me. He's about five foot nine. And after I released him from the army hospital, he was three inches shorter than me. They grafted his bones together. And the poor guy, well, he died many years ago, but uh, he was from Buffalo also. Well, these are the things that uh, you don't know what's going to happen. Oh, next one. Were you religious before you went to war? Yes, I was, uh, I was a, um, what do you call it? not an elder, I was 16 years old in my church and the minister asked that I attend the, uh, oh, I can't think of even now. Um, but I was on the on the staff more or less than me, because uh, the older members would have liked somebody younger to represent the younger people. Like you have a representative for your school or whatever. And they wanted me, they told me, I don't know why, uh, that uh, to come in and, and uh, if the younger people have a complaint about the church or the people running the church, I'm supposed to say, well, look at the Reverend. Uh, Mary Jane says she don't like what's going on, don't like the way the door, you know, just a complaint. And my mother was very, very proud. And um, uh, I stayed in while well, I'm still a member of the church and I uh, still pray. And uh, again, uh, uh, if you were an atheist before you went in, I'm sure you're God, you're a man after you come out. And again, I say you begin to, you love your buddies, you love them. Uh, not like man and woman, you know what I'm saying? If you love the guys. Uh, I had a good friend of mine, who was the first sergeant. Uh, he was the first one they called rotation. He uh, went home from, in Italy. He and I were real close. And uh, he hopped in a truck, and uh, I was doing something, and I says, Where's Sergeant Lombard? Well, he's on the truck ready to go. Oh, my God. I ran over and over. I said, Hey, Ed, you know. And uh, shook hands. Eddie, I would have been. We both stood there and we cried. So that's how close we were good buddies. Well, he passed away now. We we kept company for years after we got out of the he, we, no, Remember, this was a National Guard off from, from Buffalo. And we knew most of the people. Go out drinking, night, dancing, you know, partying. And, uh, uh, well, he died anyway. But uh, I miss him. And, uh, well, I can say I miss all my buddies because he's become a, a close knit family. Did you do anything for good luck while you were at the war? Anything special except like you just Well, I don't recall anything good luck. Uh, I didn't have any good luck charms. Uh, uh, not really. Although there was people, you know, soldiers that carried rabbits for some four leaf clovers and stuff like that. And I guess, like I say, I was going with girls and uh, <coughs> I carried their pictures and you know, you go say, well, I made it today, babes, or, you know, put, you put it back. Maybe that was my good luck charm. I don't know. How did you entertain yourself? Well, like I said, I played harmonica. There was another fellow from Batavia. He played uh, uh, Mothar harmonica. So we had two guitar players, and we had a couple piano players. And if there was a piano in any place, in fact, this guy, Joe McGuire, he was from Boston, he was a draftee from Boston, Massachusetts. He played with a big name band up there, and he was terrific. And the guitars, the piano, harmonic, we'd get together and, and we'd have our own entertainment. We'd get up, we'd dance with each other, we'd sing, because uh, there's no, no, no girls to dance with. You know, and don't think we were gay because we're dancing with each other. We just wanted to kill the time of day or night. Now again, the war was not going on 24 hours a day, 60 seconds a minute. You had your time. You know, you could, you could get a three-day pass, 
go in town, come back, schnabel up. We didn't take drugs like they, they do today. Uh, we drank. And uh, uh, the drink is to try to forget what happened yesterday, what's going to happen tomorrow. Well, when you're sober, you say, oh, I wish I wouldn't have done that. I got so inebriated on wine that to this day, I will not drink wine. Uh, I'll make beer today, but I won't touch wine. I can't even drink it. I smell grape juice. That's how sick I got on wine. They call it vino or vin. So, but like I say, we entertain ourselves. Once in a great while, I mentioned earlier, the Red Cross would come up, we'd bring a dance floor, we'd bring a wind up uh, a phonograph with Glenn Miller and Artie Shaw, Harry James, you don't know who the people are. Big name bands, World War II. And we used to dance with the girls. Red, they were American Red Cross girls. And they sit and talk, and they write letters, and they hold your hand. And uh, again, when I was in the hospital, I had bronchial pneumonia, and I was delirious. They carried me out of my tent, and I was unconscious. And uh, I woke up, and I didn't know where I was. And here's someone holding my hand. It was a nurse. I, I thought I wasn't having to have a girl holding my hand. You know, when you're in war, there are many girls hold your hands. When I woke up in the hospital, I looked up, I said, my God, there's an angel, you know? Where am I? Well, you're in the hospital, why? You know? So she told me. But these are the only times you would see a girl is if you were disabled and suffer in the hospital or when these Red Cross girls would come up and dance with you, which was very, very seldom. But when he did, you took advantage. They wouldn't dance with you all day. They would dance with you, 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 you. But what they did do, which we enlisted people thought was wrong, after they entered train the troops, they would go to the officer's tents and they would sit there and drink and whatever else, and uh, they'd come out of there and they'd be inebriated. Uh, I won't say what I think about the Red Cross. Cause they're when you were on leave, what did you do? Well, first, if uh, we had a three-day leave, we would try to get a hotel someplace. And uh, there were, uh, not like you see a hotel is here, there were flea traps, more or less. But instead of sleeping on the ground, you slept on a, on a mattress. And the bedding was clean. And after we got the uh, hotel, we'd go look for a restaurant. And uh, everything was in foreign, but we did have a foreign book. I've got the Italian and French book, which they gave us. <coughs> and we would read that and find out. Thank you. They would uh, find out where's the restaurant and so forth and so on. And uh, this is how to speak French. And uh, this isn't the African book, but uh, another book. This is telling the habits of uh, what the uh, Africans do. Well, this. Well, this is my testament I carry with me all through the war, and uh, this is addresses of my buddies, and there's some notes I play on the bugle, uh, but these things were in the pocket all the time. Like I say, my testament is there from World War, take a look if you want. Uh, I figure out what the subject was now again. <laughs> what did you do when you were out? Oh, and after we got a restroom, well then naturally, we go out looking for uh, fun activity. We go out touring, look around as tourists, uh, see what the rest of the world looked like, and uh, notice the uh, natives' habits, what they did, how they dress, and uh, how they act. And uh, uh, naturally, uh, if we saw any English ladies there, we would probably in a place would dance with them. In fact, one funny thing in the Isle of uh, uh, Capri, we had a three-day pass, and my buddy, the other harmonica player, his name was Tony Gattino, he could speak Italian. Oh, I spoke it a little bit, and because uh, you learn the language. And uh, we ended up in this hotel, and had a nice restaurant. Now, the Isle of Capri is a big resort, see? And uh, so he had a great voice. He used to sing beautifully. So they had a band there, and he went up and talked to them in Italian, and uh, he asked him to play a number. And uh, he got up, and his favorite song was, uh, While tearing off a game of golf, I might make a play for the caddy. If I do, I won't follow through, because my heart belongs to daddy. Well, he sang that, and everybody applauded. So there was two English nurses with two English officers. And um, he came back down. Well, I was still drinking veal then, so we were drinking. And, and uh, this one throws, hey, Yank. He says, yeah. He says, uh, 
would you go up and sing that? He says, uh, yeah. So he's tired, he comes back, he says, no, I'm not going to sing it. She says, why not? <coughs> well, he says, uh, I'll sing it if you give me a kiss. She says, okay, yank, so he gave her a kiss. So he got up, he sang the song, and uh, finally he went to the lavatory, and she got up and went over to the ladies' room. So I see him talking, and finally he goes like this to me. So I goes over, and he says, uh, this is so-and-so, glad to know you, and she and her girlfriend are going to leave the two British soldiers that are going to wash us, going to, they want to go out with us. Okay, so they left the British officers there and they went out with the two Yanks because uh, the Yanks had more money than, the, you know, they had cigarettes and so forth and so on. So anyway, we beat the English soldiers' time and we took the girls out, we took them canoeing. Well, they had to the, see these commercials with the, the, uh, the, uh, I the Venice where they were rolling down the, well, the, they had the grotto, which is, it's, uh, the water reflects off the luminous caves. Very beautiful. So we went through in there, and this guy's singing, oh, so, you know, whatever. And we were kissing the girls. Like I say, what the heck, you know. And then we went back, and the, the two British soldiers were gone, so we had a few more beers, and then we took the girls back to the boat, and they went back to the mainland, and we see. But you did what you did. You had to do to entertain yourself. Guys used to play baseball, football, whatever. Got about three minutes left. Okay. Humor cement. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know why I should say it or not. <coughs> uh, this was in uh, around Mount Casino. Again, like I say, at night we used to pitch the tents, the pup tents, in the daytime we broke them down. And the Germans had a uh, habit of, of uh, shelling the areas uh, at certain times. And they used to lob them as they called boom, 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 where the Americans would they'd fire by uh, sight. They'd over, over, and boom, the third shot, they would hit the target. The Germans would go boom. They hit everything in the area. But we would pick out one specific target. Um, uh, I'll show you again. Oh, so this, this corporal went into the town. How long is he, sir? Yeah, he just flipped the table and we'll start again. This corporal, Art Clifford, went into town. He was a cor uh, college graduate, and he could have been an officer, but he didn't want to be an officer. He said, I don't want to be an officer. He said, I want to be with the men. So anyhow, he came back from town, and he was pretty stiffed up by that. I had a little bit too much to drink. So his Ted mate says, uh, hey Art, you better get some sleep because you're going on guard duty from one to, to three. And he says, uh, excuse my expression, he says, I'll kiss your rear end if I do. And he says, well, he says, I'm telling you, Art, he says, uh, Sergeant Lagarde told me. So Art gets in there and goes to sleep. <coughs> so finally, the old guard comes and wakes him. Hey Art, you're on guard. He says, no, I'm not. He says, here's a list. So he had a flashlight have a red lens on it so it doesn't show too far. And your name's on the, on the list for guard duty. Ah, I mean, half snob a little bit, crawls out. And his buddy says, hey, Art, what, didn't you forget something? What, you, you told me to kiss my rear end if you're going on guard. Well, it's fully closed. So the guy, he just kissed him on the, on the head, you know. But that, you know, to us, that was hilarious. Um, other, another guy was trying to chase his Italian girl, and uh, he chased her. And all of a sudden, she come out with three other her sisters, and they ended up chasing him. He was running like mad, trying to get away from me. I mean, you know, you got you got to be there to see this, what, what's happening, and know what's in the guy's head. And then again, the funny thing, we tried to get that pig. Our first sergeant was on the. I was driving a three-quarter ton vehicle truck, and he was standing on it, and he jumped off, and he got this pig. We missed the first one. And every time I'd go here, this little pig, the pigs would run this way, so no matter which way. But finally he jumped and got this pig, and the pig was squealing. And finally, trying to hold his snoot shot, but still all the pigs, you know. That's where the farmer heard about it. And he, see, our, on the vehicles you have your, your bumper, you have your uh, unit numbers. Like it would be 209, AA, and an aircraft, and it would be E, which would be E battery. So the Italian civilian, uh, the farmer, he got it. And then he called the military police and they came over and then our captain had to explain things but we had to get the pig back. So, but these were little hilarious things. But to actually 
to, to see it, uh, to enjoy it, the humor of it, you, you would have had it in there. See a guy.